Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Good Nutrition in Every Bite. March is National Nutrition Month, and our presenter today is Lorraine Donowski. Lorraine has been a registered dietitian with the Christopher Pendergast ALS Center at Stony Brook for 15 years and is an original team member. She is also the Associate Director of the Stony Brook University Dietetic Internship Program. In December 2017, Lorraine completed her Doctorate in Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at Stony Brook, so congratulations, Lorraine, that's very exciting. Um, her dissertation entitled Quality of Care and Cost Differences in Models of Care for the Treatment of, of Patients with ALS focused on ALS and the treatment team. Um, as a reminder to everybody on the phone, there will be time at the end for Q&A. So um, please go ahead and type those questions into the chat box as they rise, and we'll get to all questions um, during the time allotted. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Lorraine. Hello and welcome um, to March uh, National Nutrition Month Lecture. I'm very honored to be here to speak with all of you today. And uh, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Aubrey. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to start um, with the, as you know, this is National Nutrition Month, and Good Nutrition in Every Bite is the title of today's webinar. And I have a nice picture of something that's healthy for people to eat, so I thought I'd start it off that way. Um, so what I plan to cover today is a few things of interest, uh, namely what is adequate nutrition and hydration, ways to obtain calories, protein, and fluid from the diet, um, how we calculate calories, protein, and fluid requirements, um, some simple ways to add extra calories. Sometimes we need to use some texture modifications, and this is done to shorten meal time, so I'm going to review some of that. Um, I'm also going to go into what to expect from a clinic visit from the dietitian, and I speak a little bit about the speech-language pathologist who is my teammate. And I'm going to touch at the end, if there's time, about some of the the things they're investigating or novel diets in the treatment of ALS. Okay. So what is adequate nutrition and hydration? So I'm starting off with some um, tools here that you can see. The uh, my plate put out by the government, it, I think pretty much everyone has seen um, in some version. It's, um, it's a tool. I don't know if it's my favorite tool, but I'm going to use it today along with some of the supplementals on the side so you can see what actually comprises a complete diet. So as you can see um, from the my plate, it's broken up into different portions. And what we want to do is have a balanced diet. So we want to include some protein, which is very important for wound healing and muscles. Um, we want to um, also include some grains, which are carbohydrates, which are very important for energy. Fruits and vegetables also fall into the carbohydrate uh, category as well. They also provide antioxidants, which are, are very uh, good for the body and some of the dairy products are there. So what's missing from the my plate is the fat category. So we had everything except the fat. So that's why in the lower left corner, I added some good sources of fat. So I have, there's a picture of oil, nuts, some peanut butter there, or another nut butter, some seeds, and some avocado. And then above that, I put water because water is very critically important to our patients. It's critical for everyone, but it's even more critical for our patients that um, they drink and consume enough water and hydration in the form of six to eight eight-ounce glasses in a day. So just to give you some other tips, um, there are other types of milk besides cow's milk. There's soy milk which is uh, probably the closest to cow's milk as far as protein goes, so that's a great uh, substitution. You can also use rice and almond milk. They tend to have less calories and less, a lot less protein. So we may have to put some things with that to really make that um, be more complete in the diet. Okay. So the other thing I want to stress is a certain amount of portion size, and I do go on to show you what a, an adequate diet or a menu for the day looks like and what the serving sizes would look like. So for here, I have some portion sizes. So the first thing which I always tell people to start with is the protein because it's important for them to get adequate protein. So meat, chicken, fish, eggs, and beans all comprise this category. And our goal is to have three to four ounces at lunch and dinner. So that's about the size of a deck of cards, or we say 
the palm of your hand and the thickness of your pinky. That's about the amount of protein you need at a lunch and dinner. At breakfast, we tend to do an egg or maybe a little less protein at breakfast, but for lunch and dinner, these are the goals we're having. Um, fruit and vegetables um, are the next two categories, so things like bananas, um, applesauce, berries, and I have some approximate sizes there. Um, so half a banana is considered a serving, but you certainly can eat the full banana. That's fine. Um, I put some easier things like applesauce and some berries and some things like that that are easier to um, chew and swallow. So half a, a cup to three-quarters of a cup is the approximate size on that. The more vegetables, the better. And they, um, we always say that they should be not cooked so they're too mushy, but they're still a good source of antioxidants. So I would tell you to eat them even if you have to cook them a little more to make them soft. And a cup to a cup and a half is the appro approximate amount. The other thing for vegetables is it's a good vehicle to put some healthy fats on them so you can get some more calories, especially if they're a little bit of a challenge to eat. So things like salads, um, which can break apart in the mouth, you can put a lot of oil, um, olive oil, um, other dressings to keep it kind of a little bit um, moist and together, and that adds calories as well. Milk or yogurt, and my favorite yogurt really is the Greek styles of yogurt because they give you a lot more protein, so it's just better nutrition. It also provides calcium and vitamin D, so a cup of milk, and um, the yogurts are generally five or six ounces, not because some of the water is drained out. They are a little less, but um, it usually equals about the same nutrition as a cup of milk, except for the protein. It's higher. Um, the other uh, sizes I'm talking about are the, for starch and grains would be things like mashed potatoes, pasta. Um, rice is, a, is, is also something that can give you some calories. A cup of rice is, um, three star, is the equivalent to eating three slices of bread or a cup and a half of mashed potatoes. And if it's challenging, again, we say put something on that uh, sauce or a gravy or oil, something to give you some good calories, and that helps you you know, keep it together um, while you're chewing and swallowing. Quinoa is also another grain that um, you know, has a lot of good nutrition. And usually it's about a half a cup is a serving, and we like two or three servings of that at a meal. The last category is fat, and I love avocados, and they give you a lot of good flavor, and they can go into some things and almost disappear. So they give flavor, but they also give that very rich fat quality, and you can mix it with some things um, to give you those fat calories. Nut butters are another good choice, and um, you can use the nut butters as a fat, or in some cases, um, it's the protein and the fat, and that's a good combination food. Okay. Um, so now for water and hydration, um, I just wanted to stress this because this is very important. Um, sometimes our patients are a little reluctant to drink the amount of water that they, they need in the course of a day, but it is important, and I have it up here so you can see some of the reasons. So more than half of the body is water, and it, it's important for all kinds of uh, processes in the body, but mostly trans, transporting nutrients. It helps you go to the bathroom. It regulates your body temperature. It helps uh, facilitate adequate blood circulation. It lubricates joints and tissues. It facilitates digestion, helps your skin. It also helps your secretions be thinner, and it's easier than to cough and get rid of them. So adequate hydration really does help. The other thing it does is it keeps your vocal cords hydrated, and that's also a very important thing that you want so you can um, have a clearer voice. Um, if hydration and water is a problem, usually we talk about um, using some techniques such as a chin tuck. So when you take the sip of water, you can put your chin down, and then you can bring it up slowly to let the water have a little more control in your mouth. We also sometimes use some thickeners, and that also helps so that you're able to get adequate hydration um, in the course of a day. So what do we want? What do we want? What's adequate nutrition? So we usually tell patients to aim to drink between six to eight, eight ounce glasses of water, juice, seltzer, decaffeinated products. Um, anything liquid at room temperature also is considered a liquid, so things like Jello or ice cream would also be considered in that liquid part. Um, the easiest way to, to start drinking enough water is to have a full glass of water at each meal, even if you have another beverage. 
Drink a full glass of water with all your medications, not just take one sip to get it down, but drink the whole water, bottle while you have it in your hand or, or a cup of water. Carry the water with you at all times. And you can add some citrus or juice or flavor your seltzers. Um, you can even drink things like iced tea and uh, decaffeinated, uh, I'm sorry, decaffeinated iced tea and some lemonade. Those things are, are easier. And they'll give you a little calories as well, but they provide needed hydration. Okay. Now, um, tips for getting the proper nutrition. If you get tired, if you tire easily while you're eating a large meal, the easiest thing to do is to eat more small, frequent meals. So think of eating five or six small meals instead of sitting down to three very large meals, which could make you tired. We try to make every bite count, so you want to use a high calorie spread on vegetables and bread. You can use whole milk, um, and you can use sauces and gravies pretty liberally because along with making things maybe a little easier to chew and swallow, it also um, will give you some needed calories. You can use low-fat milk if that's what you're accustomed to, and sometimes patients will tell me they have cardiovascular disease and they don't want to drink whole milk. But it is a good source of calories and um, you know, you can even do a 1% or a 2% milk if you want to, which will still give you some of the calories of the fat, but still maybe fit in the low-fat category, which is really the 1% milk. Um, you could always then add um, an avocado or some nut butters or something like that to make a smoothie if you want to put a healthier fat in there. But we want to make every bite count as much as possible. The other important thing that we talk to patients about is keeping the meal times down to 30 minutes even if you have to cut up the foods a little bit smaller because any t time and effort used over those 30 minutes is not worth the amount of calories that you get in. You're probably burning more trying to get those calories in as opposed to um, making it under 30 minutes um, where you know, you're getting the calories and you're not expending a lot of energy. The other thing um, we talk about is eating easier foods earlier in the day. If you know you're going to go out to visit friends and you want to conserve your energy, you want to talk, you want to be able to chew. So eat some, some easier to chew foods such as yogurt or eggs earlier in the day. And this way you can socialize and talk more. And this way you can conserve your energy for maybe a meal that's a little more challenging. Um, we try not to have you skip any meals. So if you're at a doctor's appointment or you're out and about, um, a high-calorie smoothie or milkshake will also work, and so that's something that I would encourage you to think about taking with you or take a snack with you or a sandwich with you if you're going to the, to the doctor um, or going to an appointment and you're, you're going to be held up. Anticipate and take some of the foods you, you can easily chew and swallow with you. Okay, so now we're turning some of these um, practical or theoretical things into what's actually food on your plate. Okay. So, and I, uh, throughout the talk, I put some of my resources that are going to be available to you on the sides so you can just get an idea of what it looks like. Oh, that's what the smoothie sh um, handout looks like. Um, these will all be available to you. And the, the high-calorie uh, high and easy-to-chew recipe books, booklets, you know, um, are a few pages it's more than a few, but um, there's a lot of good ideas in there. So, And there's other resources that I'll have for you at the end. So high-calorie supplements add a lot of calories, protein, and fluid in a small volume. And they may be easier to consume and help you keep those meal times under 30, 30 minutes. So that should be something you can consider. There's a wide variety out there. There are ready-made smoothies. There are smoothies in, in the book, booklet that will tell you how to make them from home. Um, you can have a good old-fashioned milkshake, um, wide variety. You can buy pre-made smoothies, and you can also buy pre-made supplements such as um, Boost, um, Ensure, any of those, those products. The reason I like to see maybe some smoothies and some other things is because there are things you can make with ingredients you have at home, and you don't have to spend. And you know those don't. They are made with vitamins and minerals to be enhanced products but you can still mix yours up with fruits, um, in some cases vegetables, and still include good things that would comprise a, a well-balanced diet with things you have at home. So for some patients, we do some texture modifications, 
And so we encourage you to take smaller bites. We usually say around the size of your thumbnail. And this may help to keep the meal times 30 minutes and cause you to have a little less chewing and a little less work. Um, we can thicken some liquids, and I alluded to this before. So there are some com commercially prepared products, Simply Thick or other um, smoothies that are a little bit thicker. That you can make them with a natural thickener, such as a banana. That will add some calories. Um, I guess the protein comes from the smoothie, but not from the banana. <laughs> Um, and nectars are a little thicker and sometimes easier to swallow, and so those can be included in the diet as well. Um, they do have a good amount of calories in some of the nectars, and so those would be something that you could actually include in your smoothie. The high-calorie cookbook can help add variety and more balanced nutrition to your diet, so we'll go into that at the end. I have a, a lot of different um, recipes in there that are relatively easy to make and can provide some good nutrition. Okay, so this again is is just a way of turning it into what is food that we see on a on a fake plate um, look like as real food in our real lives. So for the first food group, we have uh, meat or protein, and I said you should have two or more servings a day. So a serving is three ounces of hamburger, fish, or two cups of beans. So it would be two or more. In most cases, more would be what you would want. You would want the three ounces at lunch and dinner and hopefully a little bit of protein at breakfast. Um, milk or yogurt would be two or more servings. So you could do eight ounces of milk at one uh, meal and do some yogurt at another meal. Fruits and vegetables, kind of um, the more the better, so five or more, and this would be a half a cup of cooked or one cup of. Some of the raw vegetables might be difficult to ha to eat unless they are really um, finely um, minced and also may require a lot of chewing. So you may go for things that are cooked um, and some of the softer fruits that are like peaches that are softer, um, bananas, um, and some of the fruit you can also blend if that would make it easier so you still get the antioxidant properties of the fruits um, and the fruit, and you, you get the good properties from them, and you don't have to work as hard to chew and swallow. Um, grains or starch would be a wide variety because, you know, women may be on the six servings a day to maintain their weight, and men might be on the 11 side, so that's why that's a wide range of servings in a day. So an example of this would be a half a cup of pasta, a third of a cup of rice, or a slice of bread. Bread sometimes does become difficult to swallow because it gets very gummy. So sometimes I, I include more things in the diet, such as the mashed potatoes or um, mashed sweet potatoes or sometimes pasta if that's easier to, to eat than um, chewing the bread. Uh, sometimes toasting the bread and putting a nice um, fattening spread on it is another way that is easier for patients to chew and swallow um, that type of a carbohydrate. And then, of course, fat is just your opportunity to add calories and make the food taste really good. So butter, olive oil, some cream cheese, all those things, the nut butters, um, spread avocado on your toast and put an egg on it. Um, those are some ways to get some really good um, fat calories and add to the diet. And so here I, I turn this into, I think I made it 1,700 to 2,100 calories, kind of depending on... Um, the size of the portions you pick, and um, I made the snack a little vague. But so this is just an example. You can have a scrambled egg, which is a protein. The butter would be the fat. You can use olive oil to cook your egg if you prefer that. A cup of oatmeal, which would be two servings of starch. And again, I added the butter. The other thing we sometimes add is a nut butter because that's of some protein and some fat, and that mixed in will be um, a good source of nutrition. For lunch, I did do this as a sandwich, um, but again, you could do a piece of fish with lettuce and tomato, um, some kind of oil or dressing on a soft roll, or you could use um, potato as the starch in that case, a glass of milk, some applesauce, and some water, of course. And then for dinner, I did a similar thing. I did at least three ounces of chicken, which is three servings of protein, a cup of mashed potatoes with some butter, which gives you, again, some starch and some fat calories. I gave you some vegetables, gravy or sauce, and that's fat, um, and you're just adding some extra calories. If you don't want a, 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 a gravy that is maybe a, a, a meat uh, fat-based sauce, 
you can consider using some other kind of sauces that are higher in calories that give you maybe or and have an olive oil base that would give you a little bit more flavor and make it easier for you to um, uh, chew and swallow the meat. Uh, I have van- vanilla yogurt there with some blueberries, which would taste good as a nice little dessert. And then I have included here is a cup of ice cream or smoothie and water. And so you can see that this is what you would need to eat in the course of a day, and it totals between 1,700 and 2,100 calories and gives you adequate protein, actually more than adequate protein with what I have listed there. Okay. So this now gives you an idea of what a day should look like. Um, and you know if you can you know strive to eat the recommended amounts to keep your nutrition up. So what do we do in clinic? What do I do when I see patients in clinic? So um, usually the first it starts by weighing a patient, and I try to find out if what their usual weight history is. Um, are, have they lost any weight? What was their usual adult weight, and how far are we away from that? Many of my patients, I'll ask them if they have a scale and can stand on the scale at home to weigh themselves once a week just so we kind of have an idea how they're doing. Are they staying about the same? Um, Are they losing weight? And to give me a call um, between clinic visits if they need to so we can discuss ways to keep your nutrition up. Um, I also look at the fluid intake um, because we have observed that drinking, you know, increased water keeps you hydrated and out of the hospital. Um, and I think I've driven this point home, so I'm just going to say that again, that it's important to get adequate fluid intake. So, you know, what I tell patients is that, you know, your urine should be the color of very pale straw, and sometimes I also um, test um, your skin, what we call skin turgor, which is just where we take, um, rest your hand on your lap, and we, we just pinch um, some of your skin together, not painfully, but just to see if it goes flat quickly or if it stays tinted. So if it stays up in the air, that usually means that the patient is a little dehydrated. Um, And for those who have access to computers, you can go on and see pictures of this as well. I didn't include any here. Um, So that means that you need to step up your hydration and to drink more um, water, juice, liquids to uh, get your hydration back up. I also look at other people's past medical history to make sure that I'm including everything at the visit. You know, if they um, have diabetes or they have heart, uh, cardiovascular disease, I'm taking those things into account when I'm doing my assessment. As I said, we look at the weight trends, um, and we look at things. We ask for use of respiratory equipment as well, um, and I'm going to go into that in a few minutes. But these are some of the things that go into the nutrition assessment. Okay. So the other thing that I do at clinic, um, and I don't usually do this in front of a patient, but I'm going to go back when I'm making my assessment and estimate how much, um, how many calories they need. So I gave you just a little guidance here. So it's 25 calories per kilogram, and that's kind of to maintain your weight. 30 calories per kilogram would be weight, you know, to encourage a weight gain, or if you're having some mild stress, or um, if you're starting to have any, you know, respiratory issues, probably we're close to the 30 mark. 35 calories would be for someone who's a little more highly stressed and they have high caloric needs, and that may also be due due to the work of respiration. So I gave you some examples underneath. So a 45-pound woman um, divided by 2.2 to turn it into kilograms because we have to make everything complicated. Um, So she's 66 kilograms times 25 calories would equal equal about, um, I put 1650 there because some people are exacting, but in my mind that would be 1,700 calories would be required for that person to maintain their weight. Um, I did the same thing below with a 185-pound man. He ends up being 84 kilograms, and I gave him 30 calories, so he needs 2,500 calories. So um, just going back to the menu that I provided, that was only 21, so that person would have to add 400 calories on, which would probably be another smoothie or maybe even another like a sandwich or something like that to get make up those extra calories. Okay. Um, and then protein needs, um, as I said, protein is very important. Um, and the RDA, or what we use as the guideline of the recommended uh, dietary allowance for protein is 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per kilogram. Um, if you have any other stresses, we may need to, you know, an infection or anything else, we would um, probably estimate higher needs of protein 
um, in certain situations. So I gave, again, the example, I have a 165-pound man would require between 60 and 75 grams of protein. When stressed, that same man may require closer to 90 or 112 grams of protein. Um, generally, um, protein is um, one of the things that we tell people to concentrate on eating first so that you get adequate protein, and then the rest of the calories we hope fill in after that. Okay. Um, now, so for those who um, use the non-invasive ventilation, um, this helps um, as far as it slows your, weight of, your rate of weight loss. It rests the respiratory system and gives you some more energy throughout the course of the day. And I went to one conference where they called it a nutritional supplement, and I said, wow, that's so different than what I've ever heard because a nutritional supplement to me is um, a smoothie, something very high calorie, sometimes it's a bar, but it's, it's caloric. And even though it's not a traditional nutritional supplement, it conserves calories because it rests your respiratory system and you don't use up as many calories for the, throughout the course of the day. So that's why I bring this up, and that's why I bring it up in the nutrition assessment, because I want to know, you know, should I be estimating more calories so they can maintain their weight? So if you use the non-invasive ventilation, it actually does help slow the rate of weight loss. Okay, so what would you expect from a clinic visit from the dietitian? So we take weight, and we um, take a weight history, as I said before. Um, we have a wheelchair scale, so we usually can weigh at all patients. Um, I ask the length of meal times, and if I don't, um, the speech language pathologist always asks me, did you ask how long it took them to eat? Because we always kind of use that as a gauge. Um, we tr I try to get a, a typical day's intake, um, usually on the first visit. And if, if a lot of weight loss is occurring, I'll ask it again. Um, so I go with the speech-language pathologist, so I listen to her talk about communication, and she has to listen while I get the 24-hour uh, recall. So um, I've learned a lot about communication devices, and she's probably learned a lot about what people typically eat in the course of a day. Um, so that's how we work together. Um, I usually try to um, you know, address hydration, and at my clinic and many other um, and many other team others uh, team members visit with a partner. So my partner is a speech language pathologist because we're interested in kind of similar things. Is there weight loss? What's their swallowing ability? How can we make the diet better for them? Do we need to make any texture changes or thicken any fluids? Um, our speech language pathologist um, will also generally have you drink some water so we can see how you're doing as far as swallowing goes, and it helps us see if we need to thicken the fluids, and um, also we talk some about te textures, and again, as I said, the speech-language pathologist um, goes into the communication devices. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some of my resources that I have um, that you'll be provided with. So, oh, I did this, here we go. <laughs> So the first resource I, uh, I created here was how to build a better smoothie. And I can't take credit for this. One of my interns came up with this for uh, something different, but it was to lower calories. So I changed it and made it for higher calories. Um, so the first step is to pick a base. So we say to, to choose a liquid base that's rich in nutrients and calories, juice, coconut milk, almond milk, whole milk, all great options. And you're going to take about a cup of that. You're going to add something as a thickener, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, um, ice cream can be used sometimes as well, and that can be about a half a cup. Add fruit for flavor and sweetness. So you can do one to two servings of fruit per smoothie. You can do bananas, berries, cherries, mangoes, all add great flavor. And the banana has the added um, advantage of adding some thickness. Um, one of the smoothie recipes you're going to see in the cookbook um, has some spinach in it, but you can eat some greens like kale or spinach, and you can um, mix them up in the blender. Um, they don't have a large taste in the smoothie, but you will notice the color is different. And you run the blender until the smoothie is completely blended, and um, it's the thickness you want, and it's also the flavor that you want. You can add some flavor boosters, chocolate, uh, syrup, cinnamon, nutmeg, any extracts you want. Um, and for some, we even add some peanut, almond, or cashew butter to give you some extra protein. I think I have a banana... Elvis shake or something in the book that has um, some peanut butter in there. 
Okay, so that's one of the resources that I have to help you get some extra calories. Um, and this is my high calorie and easy to chew recipes. Again, um, the interns worked on this with myself and since then I've added some other recipes. So um, the breakfast items are listed here. This slide's um, not as clear as I would like it to be, but you know, there's enhanced oatmeal, um, pancakes, there's um, omelets, French toast, things that have a lot of high calories in it. I did some soups because I thought that would be something that would be excellent. And the shrimp bisque, I guess I have highlighted there because that would also be a good source of protein. Um, there's creamy, creamy tomato soup, avocado soup, all those are going to be higher in calories. I have some of the main dishes, which is like an easy lasagna, which is actually layering, layering some ravioli to make it a little easier um, with some tomato sauce and some other things. Um, I have some meatloaf recipes, salmon, which is another healthy um, option and easy to flake, flake apart and um, chew and swallow. Um, some of the other things like the veggie mac and cheese might take a little more time. Um, there's a quick chili, but there, there's also grits and things like that that you can also enhance. I did a few desserts there, and I did some snacks. So that's what's in the High Calorie and Easy to Chew cookbook. Many of the things can be pureed or, or blended if that's necessary, and some of them are just softer cooked and, and easier to eat in their whole state. Um, so how else can you add some, some extra calories to your diet? Um, so let's say in the case of the man who needs 2,500 calories, you could take the 2,100 that we talked about, the menu, and you could add a little bit of avocado to the meal. You could add some um, peanut butter or other nut butter which gives you some protein as well. Hard cooked or scrambled eggs can be added. Um, some olive oil, two teaspoons of olive oil um, can be added to most of your meals to give you some good healthy fat calories. Ice cream and yogurt are other ways to um, end your meal. Half of a medium banana or half of a mango is another thing that's usually soft if they're nice and ripe and can give you some, some nice calories along with some cottage cheese sour cream. We usually tell patients, add extra sauces and gravies, add extra mayonnaise or salad dressing to salads and meals to make it easier to chew and swallow. Everything will be moist and it adds some extra calories. Um, those little pudding cups are also good to give you like a little snack when you're hungry. Um, and the foods I have stored there actually give you the benefit of some protein as well as um, extra calories. Okay. Um, this is high calorie and protein supplements and this is a list of a lot of different products. Um, some of them we have locally here but um, there, it's a wide variety and the things I added was um, to this list that's a little different and some of the things I'll point out is um, for our patients are things like uh, the Magic Cup which stays um, a certain consistency along with some of the smoothies that are here. Um, so just to go down the list, the first couple are, except for the designer whey protein, which is a protein powder that you could add to mashed potatoes or something else to give yourself some extra protein if that was something you needed. Um, but those are commercial shakes that are about 8 ounces and, and give you a little more calories and protein. You can see I have listed there. You can do a fast food shake at... Um, any, any place, and they range in size, so that's why that's a wide variation in calories and protein, but that will also give you some good calories. I did give you some bars and some powders. Carnation Instant Breakfast I always have because you can buy that in the store, and you can mix that with whole milk. So that's a good way to get some calories and protein just at the supermarket. Um, the ProShore and the Pro Protein X are on there as well. The next one I just want to call your attention to is the Scandi Shake. So one envelope of that is 440 calories, and when you mix that with milk, it's close to 600, and it gives you 14 grams of protein. So what I would say is that's one of the bigger bangs for the buck as far as calories and protein go, So um, and you can buy those online. And so if you really want to give yourself 16, 600 extra calories, that's a good way to do it. Um, ideally, I would like it to be a little higher in protein, but um, I'll take the fact that it's that high in calories. There's some other protein powders on here, um, uh, some smoothies that are on here. The Siggy's Vanilla is delicious. I've had that. Um, and the Benacalorie is really a protein um, and a fat enhancer. 
that you can add to foods. Um, I think it's equal to one gram of protein. I mean, um, seven grams or one ounce of protein, and it's about 330 calories. Prostat is a liquid protein supplement um, that is very sweet, so you'd have to mix it with something. But if you did need some extra protein, that would be a way to do it. Um, but if you are able to drink other types of things with protein in it, those would be my choice before that. Um, okay. So we're heading into the the home run here, um, the final base. And I just wanted to touch on some novel diet approaches in ALS. So um, I get some questions about different supplements, and I, you know, patients bring what they have with them to clinic. I usually take a look to see what's going on and just make sure they're not getting too much of any one vitamin or mineral. So I did look today, so it's hot off the presses to look for coconut oil. I did find some some work with coconut oil um, through the Deanna protocol, and I didn't see a lot specifically for our patient population, but from what they think, um, the, this is a type of medium chain triglyceride oil, and then it gets converted to ketone bodies, and they feel that that sustains um, the neurons' vi viability. Um, it protects the cells um, from uh, pro-oxidant insults, which means that it acts as an antioxidant. So while um, it's a lot of the sat it's, it's saturated fat, so people go back and forth whether it's good for you or not, um, but small amounts of coconut oil in the diet can add some calories but I just didn't find a lot of evidence, and we just don't know enough at this point in time. Um, I did look up the ketogenic and some higher fat diets, and the higher fat diets will give you some extra calories, and um, so those are excellent to uh, do. I don't know uh, as far as the fat goes um, with the regular diet, but they are doing some work with the ketogenic diet, and what they found was that um, there was protective mechanism and more, again, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties that they're finding, discovering with the ketogenic diet. Again, we don't know a lot. Um, still, they're still doing more research, but that um, some of the higher fat would actually be something that would be good. Um, and the Deanna protocol, um, patients ask me about this quite a bit. This incorporates the coconut oil um, as a, actually a rub and also um, as something that you can take in um, orally. It's the main ingredients are the alpha ketoglutarate, the different types of CoQ10, the NADH, and something called GABA. And what they think um, this does is it's a more efficient energy source for the mitochondria, so that's beneficial in that way. Um, and in that sense, it's similar to the ketogenic diet. It also prevents glutamate excitotoxicity and, again, has those antioxidant effects. So... Uh, you know, the articles that I read, um, again, talked a little bit about the Deanna protocol, um, and the jury was still out about how, how helpful it was. Um, they did talk a little bit about the cost. But these are things you'll be seeing some more research being done on and probably uh, some more things that would um, be something you may want to consider in your diet in the future. So um, I think at this point I'll probably start taking some questions if that's okay. Lorraine, thank you so much. That was a really fabulous presentation. Um, I learned actually a lot, and you wouldn't think that there would be novel approaches um, in nutrition, but I found that to be particularly cool. Um, so thank you so much for going through all of that. We did have a couple of questions come through. Uh, okay. I'll start with those, but as a reminder to folks on the phone, uh, please go ahead and type in any and all questions that you would like Lorraine to answer, and we'll get to those as soon as possible. Um, However, we did have one that came in um, from Donald asking, how about baked potatoes and baked sweet potatoes? Are they uh, good for carbs? Those are excellent for carbs as well. Um, the sweet potatoes I like even better, but the potatoes have some fiber in them, and those are actually good carbs that are you can load them up with some um, good fats as well and, and eat them, and those are also excellent sources of carbs. Great. Thank you. Um, and then Richard had a question. He was just mentioning, as I'm listening, I realize that this is more for gaining weight. 
My problem is because I'm not active, I find that I'm gaining weight. Do you have anything that will help? Um, so sometimes what happens is the weight distribution changes, so your arms and your legs get a little thinner, but you um, collect some of the weight around your waist. Um, we usually try not to, unless someone um, is uh, has a very high BMI, we usually don't um, really reduce their weight. We just would try to have them be a healthy amount of calories and, and protein. But as far as the weight distribution goes, that's going to happen because the arms, the muscles are, are um, getting a little thinner and um, the weight will collect around, around your waist. Um, if you're truly gaining weight, um, you know, your weight is going up, which um, does happen on occasion. Uh, that would mean that you're probably eating more calories than you need, and therefore you might want to start cutting back on, on some things if you're having a lot of snacks in that case um, or dessert with every meal, you would start to cut those things back. But I generally um, don't really weight reduce too many people um, unless, unless it's a real problem. Great. And along the same lines as the diet you're suggesting, would you suggest less processed foods in the diet? Um, I, I come from a very whole foods approach. Um, whoever we see, um, I see other patients as well. Um, we're very unprocessed. We like to see people cooking and using real food. Um, we do feel it, it has better nutritional value. Um, it's better digested, and it gives you more good nutrition through antioxidants and, and fiber and other good things in the, in the meals. So, yes, I, unprocessed foods are definitely the way to go. Great. Thank you. And I know we didn't touch on this specifically, Lorraine, but um, where can we look for information on options when tube feeding? For example, can you feed pureed foods via PEG and flush to keep from clogging, or is that not recommended? So when I first entered the field, I'll give you a historical perspective. We, we did uh, train people to um, puree their diets to put it down the feeding tube. Then with a lot of commercial products that were easier and um, very, um, what's the word, I guess they, we didn't have to worry about people ha being very clean when they processed their food in the blender and, and so forth, and that they were doing a balanced diet because it came already in the can. Now we're swinging back where people don't want to be on synthetic canned food, and they are starting to puree um, foods again. So there are um, actually, I have recipes for how to make a homemade tube feeding. The only thing is it's a lot of work, um, which is fine. I would still say that if you want to do it. And I believe there's even um, other organizations. Um, if you looked locally, you could find someone who could uh, teach you how to turn food into a, a tube feeding product if you wanted to. There's a few on the market as well. They're very expensive. And I Still, I guess, would say that if you're going to really do this, it's a big-time commitment. It's definitely better nutrition um, for you. You do have to have a certain size feeding tube, which you'd have to, you know, we would have to look up exactly the size. We may have to strain the foods in some cases to make sure that we don't clog it. Um, and you would have to very much um, be, rent, you know, um, flushing the tube to make sure um, you can do it, um, but you want to do it in a way so to make sure that you don't cause any problems with the um, with the tube itself. Great, thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer. Um, so another question: Once we increase the daily protein to help care for, say, skin breakdown or an infection, do we keep the daily protein goal higher after the wound has healed because we see the patient is at risk going forward, or should the protein intake go back down to normal? Well, so there's a lot of things that happen with skin breakdown. Um, so turning and positioning is very important as well. So I would say if someone's kind of at risk and they're newly healed, I wouldn't perhaps take it down to normal. I guess I would always want to make sure that they had maybe just a little bit more protein. So instead of doing the 0.8, I'd do 1, maybe 1.2, as long as they had good kidney function, um, just to make sure that, that there was no um, further breakdown. Perfect, thank you. Um, Daniel uh, says, my appetite has been reduced. I take Magestrol, which helps, but sometimes I just don't like eating a lot. Any suggestions? Um, do you take the, the Megase on a regular basis? Are we, am I allowed to ask? You can ask, and we'll see if he responds. Um, he yes. Yes. Okay, 
terrific because um, for that to work, it really has to build up in your bloodstream. Um, and sometimes patients don't understand that they take one or two doses and they don't notice anything and they give up. So keep going. Um, what I would just say is um, if you don't feel like eating a lot, then I would be breaking it up to smaller meals uh, throughout the day. And for some people, I tell them to set an alarm on their watch or, or alarm in their house to remind them that they should be eating or drinking something at least every couple hours. Um, because with this disease, um, they did a, a small study a long time ago, and they said that, that most patients um, have their stomach empty slower. And so you don't get that same cue to eat because you're not as hungry. And we know this from people that we do tube feed, that sometimes they just get to the end of the day and they don't even want that last, that last um, can of feeding because they're full. Perfect. I think he found that to be very helpful. Um, well, I believe that was the last question that came through the chat. Um, but Lorraine, just to sort of hit home the point, could you just reiterate how important nutrition is when um, managing the symptoms of ALS and why that is? Well, the important points to remember is that, um, well, nutrition is important for all diseases and for everyone. Um, it maintains your immune system functioning, which is very important for the ALS patient. So if you go to a doctor appointment or a clinic appointment and you have some reserve and you do you know, happen to come down with a cold or the flu or something, you have some reserve, and that's very important, and your immune system is up and functioning, and that's why the, the nutrition um, maintains that and keeps that, that up. It's not the only thing, but it's very important. Um, it also keeps you from feeling weak and fatigued, especially um, the hydration part of the um, lecture, and also the protein and, and calories to keep you from losing a lot of weight. Um, and it also helps give you some padding. Um, so if you are sitting for a little bit, you have a little bit more reserve as far as protein and a little bit more fat. And um, I just can't say how important it is. It, it's very important to keep your nutrition up. Um, and that's why, you know, we do do some things with tubes early on so that people can maintain their good nutrition um, throughout the course of their disease. Perfect. That's great. Um, and before we close out, is there anything, any important takeaways other, I mean, that was a pretty important one, um, but is there one particular takeaway you'd like people to go away from with this um, webinar? Well, I would like them to um, look at what they eat and determine if they're doing a good job. If it's um, based on what I gave them, if they think that they're eating adequate protein and enough calories and fluid for the course of the day, then they don't need to do probably anything else, just weigh themselves once in a while um, to make sure that that is the case. If they notice that their appetite is decreasing or their weight's going down or they're having increased troubles chewing or swallowing, that's when they should call, um, since we see people every three months, that sometimes a lot goes on in between those three months and that they should call in and talk to the dietitian or their physician or the nurse because we may have some practical tips that may help them. And so that would be, I think, something that I would hope that they would walk away with. Call if you notice that your weight is, is decreasing um, or you're having increasing difficulty chewing and swallowing. Fabulous, Lorraine. Thank you so very much today for all of your time and for being here for National Nutrition Month, um, obviously such an incredibly important part of um, what we do um, in the community. So thank you very much. And Lorraine's uh, slide deck in PDF format, a copy of the recording, as well as all of the supplemental resources she went over will be sent out to each of you uh, probably sometime tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. Um, otherwise, Lorraine, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a good day, everyone.